afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and we're going to get today's meeting started. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report, Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few announcements. First, I want to let folks know that our June board meeting schedule will be posted by the end of this week. We have a very busy month coming up next week, so I encourage you all to check uh, that out, which it will be on our public meetings section of our website. Uh, secondly, uh, as I've said uh, several times before, I do want to remind folks that we do have an ongoing public comment uh, taking place. We have a portal on our website for anyone who wants to comment on the potential uh, subsequent agreement with CMMI on an all-payer model. We uh, are collecting those comments and sharing those with our partners at AHS and the governor's office as they are taking the lead in the negotiations. And then last, uh, I wanna update the board on an addition to the agenda, a very small addition, although it's important, important staff update um, that we'll have before the uh, FY21 revised um, budget discussion from One Care Vermont, Marissa Melamed and Elena Barabee will provide about a 10 minute introduction to that presentation. And that is all I have to share today. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, May 19th. Is there a motion? So no moved. Move. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, May 19th. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you. So before we get into uh, the primary focus of today's meeting, I know that the healthcare advocate had wanted to um, speak to us about uh, an idea he has. And so I'll call on Mike Fisher to uh, speak at this time. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, an idea I have, um, maybe a story I have, and uh, that, that leads me to some questions. Um, <clears throat> as you know, we get a, you know, a constant stream of cases of Vermonters who call the healthcare advocate's office with challenges getting access to care. And lots of times we're able to really provide help. Uh, lots of times the complexities of uh, interactions between payers and providers uh, and transitions between health systems, uh, between, between different payers um, is a really complex world that um, I am so thankful I have a, a team that can do the legal research to help people out and we can refer people to the right place um, but there are lots of times when we bump into issues where there just really isn't a fix and where uh, any reasonable person would look at it and go, boy, that's just nuts. We ought to be able to fix that. And I, I, I wanted to tell a story, not specific, not because I, I think the specifics of this story um, is what I want to focus on, but because it's, it's sort of indicative of, of the kind of thing I'm talking about. I have permission to tell uh, to to tell more detail, but I'm going to stay on this high, higher level for the purposes of this. Um, so, uh, and I'm not intending to call out any individual hospital or or actor here. I think this is these are systemic issues. Um, uh, so, um, patient is working with a specialist. I will say at UVM, um, who uh, and the patient and their and their specialist says. Uh, hey, you need to go get this image. <clears throat> um, let's look for the right place that's most convenient for you to get the image. And uh, they identify a place and uh, the patient does their homework and uh, and calls the provider and says, hey, I'm here's my income. I, I think I'm eligible for patient financial assistance. Uh, is that true? And, and clarifies that they are. Um, they go off and get the image. Um, and then um, the uh, the hospital and and the, and and the image itself is covered, but the hospital uh, has a contract with um, another entity to to read the image, Vermont radiologists, um, who um, for whom the the image is not 
um, the, the reading is not covered by the patient financial assistance. Now that's one problem. And I don't think anybody hears the, sort of the contracting of individual of, of subcontracting for around patient financial assistance. That's not that is a problem in this story, but it's not the one I'm here to to talk about. The dynamic that seems crazy to everyone I've talked to is that you have a specialist who is gonna not is not asking for an image to be read read, uh, and you have a hospital who says, "Oh, we have to have the image read." And it seems to it seems to me like reasonable people would say, why would we read it twice? Now, there might be arguments for quality um, that having a second reader makes sense. Um, but I guess I would question that or maybe I would ask that um, uh, that it, it well, it seems to me like there are examples like this where there's duplicates duplicate efforts um, that cost the system money, in this case, uh, cost the individual money that they can't pay that will result in bad debt. Um, and this is not a new story. I, I've been at this effort for a while. I've been, we've been talking about duplication of efforts forever. I mean, ever since I started being here and much longer. And so I ask, are there low hanging fruits like this? Are people who live the, the day to day, I'm talking hospital administrators in particular, are, um, aware of things that happen regularly that they think, boy, that should be fixed. That's ridiculous. Um, and, uh, that, that could be identified, evaluated uh, to see whether they, there is a fix. Um, I guess I fear a little bit that the likes of me and and you all and people listening, people in this meeting are often so focused on broad systemic issues that we miss the low hanging, the smaller, if very important low hanging fruit. So that's I, I I called Kevin earlier and told him the story and he suggested I say it here um, just to sort of lay it at at your feet and with just a a regular recognition of some of the stuff that needs to be fixed. And for some uh, that type of committee to work, Mike, I really think that you need to have um, a doctor willing to serve on the committee, uh, a hospital administrator willing to serve on the committee. Um, and I'm sure we could come up with a, a whole list of uh, uh, titles. Um, but the whole purpose of today was to throw that out there to see if there's some interest by some people to um, start a committee that just looks at all these stories because we all get them and um, looks at those and maybe tries to uh, share those, um, not so much the details of the story, but um, the lessons that could be learned from the story. And so um, that's really what uh, we're talking about here today, just to see if there's any type of interest um, to do such a thing. So I don't I don't expect to get anybody to give us instantaneous feedback, but um, maybe we could bring this up again at uh, the next board meeting under old business and just have a little discussion about it and see if there's any uh, any uh, volunteers out there who would like to uh, serve on such a committee. So thank you, Mike. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn the meeting over to Elena and Marissa to introduce us to today's discussion on the 2021 um, uh, ACO budget. So Marissa, uh, Malena. Hi, Chair Mullen, thank you, and good afternoon, board members. Uh, my remarks this afternoon are going to be pretty brief, um, and I think just me, unless Elena has anything to add, um, I'm really just gonna talk to you about the process of the revised 2021 ACO budget. I'm going to show just some slides to orient us. So just bear with me a minute. Let me know if they're visible. Yes, they are. Great. OK, so the budget guidance and the budget order. Uh, and again, my name is Marissa Melamed. I'm the um, Healthcare Policy Associate Director and 
administrator of the ACO oversight process by way of introduction. So the budget guidance and the budget order require a revised ACO budget to be presented in the spring of the budget year. So this process is laid out in the budget order and it includes elements described there, which I'll show you on a following slide. The budget adjustment process is established in Rule 5, Section 5.407, and that is that staff will review and come back to the board with any performance that has varied substantially from its budget. Um, if performance has varied substantially from the ACO's budget, um, then upon application of the ACO, the board may adjust the ACO's budget. Um, so what that means is that the um, ACO may request uh, an ad adjustment to their budget as they did last year um, under the circumstances of the public health emergency, um, and we will review that. Or if uh, staff identifies a substantial variation, um, then that will also come back before the board and the uh, ACO may request an adjustment to their budget under those circumstances um, to avoid any sort of um, enforcement. If a vote is needed, it will be noticed. Uh, there is no vote for today. Um, if there's no request for an adjustment or no substantial variation is found, um, then no vote is needed. And uh, future analysis will be built off of the revised budget um, once we are completed with our review. This slide shows the elements that One Care is required to submit with the revised budget. They include final payer contracts, attribution by payer, the revised budget financial statements using the templates provided by Green Mountain Care Board staff and any other templates, uh, final descriptions of population health initiatives, hospital dues for 2021 by hospital, hospital risk for 2021 by hospital and payer, documentation of any changes to the overall risk model for 2021, source of funds for its 2021 population health management program, uh, explanation of the value-based incentive fund settlement, the most recent strategic plan, and any other information the board deems relevant to ensuring compliance with this order. And the final slide here just has the language on uh, performance review and adjustment under rule 5.407, which I won't read through. And that is all that I have for remarks. If there are any questions about the review or the process, um, we can address those. Otherwise, um, we can turn it over to One Care for their presentation. Any questions? <laughs> If not, we'll turn it over to the One Care team. And whenever you're ready, Vicki. Great, thank you very much. So, Vicki Lohner, CEO, One Care Vermont, and I have with me today Tom Boys, Vice President of Finance, One Care Vermont. Tom is going to put the slides up for us momentarily. In order to just quickly walk through the budget testimony today, I'm going to give a update on our 501c3 application, as well as an update, a very quick update on our final strategic plan. Um, once we get into the execution phase, I am more than happy to come back um, and talk to the committee about the rollout of the strategic plan. Thanks, Tom. I see it. Does everybody else see the screen? We did, and of course, everybody wants to know whose baby we saw. <laughs> oh, that was my sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. All right, Tom. Thank you. I wanted to um, let uh, the board and the members of the public know, although this might be a little bit of stale news at this point in time, that. One Care Vermont did receive approval from the federal government to be recognized as a 501c3 organization. We had submitted our application back in October of last year and in April received the official 
recognition of the designation that we have indeed been operating and will continue to operate for nonprofit purposes. So this was a milestone um, moment for One Care Vermont and certainly validation for us that our operating procedures and the way that we do business really are in furtherance of healthcare promotion and um, the primary prevention and programs that we run. So we're very proud of this recognition and um, we're delighted that this was a fairly expeditious process by the federal government. And uh, that's a kudos to the staff and legal team that helped to develop a very thorough process and uh, a special thank you to the Secretary of the Agency of Human Services, Mike Smith, who wrote a nice um, letter to complement the application on the work that we're doing under the LPAIR model. Next slide, Tom. I want to spend the next probably 10 or 15 minutes talking about our strategic planning process. Um, and just for our grounding purposes, we did pass the plan that you're about to see in very short form today. And this presentation was also provided at our May Board of Managers meeting in the public session. So it might be a repeat for some of you on, um, on today. I would say that this has been a very robust process of the Board of Managers, the One Care Vermont team, and looking forward over the next three years in terms of what our core capability should be, where should we be focusing our energy and strategies, and what would a refreshed mission, vision, and values looks like now that we're, you know, close to five years into our operations under this, this model and where we want to go to. It was um, a very intensive process. We structured this in a way to have an outside facilitator who had structured interview questions and processes for over 40 stakeholders. And we have a fairly exhaustive list of those stakeholders that represented our boards, employees at One Care, our patient and family advisory committee, all the provider association um, around the state as part of this process that were interviewed um, as part of our strategic planning process before we even met together as a group to really gather um, feedback on what were the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for us as an organization as we, as we move into the future. All of this was based on and formed off from some uh, presentations and information that we had received from McKinsey and Associates, um, who has a national perspective on ACO's data best practices and what would make them successful. So they kicked off our strategic plan planning process with a presentation to our board of managers and um, consumers to talk about what a successful ACO would look like and what are some of those core capabilities that we really need to hone in on. As I said, we also really engaged our employees at One Care. We created a survey for all One Care employees that really um, looked at all the same questions that we had had as part of the stakeholder interview questions and rolled that into a survey. We had very good um, feedback on that survey and really good participation. About 71% of it, the employees participated in the survey. We were delighted to see that the findings um, with the stakeholders the external to One Care and our internal stakeholders, which are our employees, really complemented each other um, and gave a clear um, opinion and path for us to move forward. And so that was nice to see that alignment. Also during this process, we had um, five weeks of a fairly intensive process where we had members, employees, not leaders, but um, employees within One Care that represented every department within One Care uh, that came together with our board members to look at our mission, vision, and values 
and ask, could we use this as a guidepost to where we want to go in the future? And does it really um, depict of who we are as an organization and where we want to go? And so as part of that process and the approval that went through at our May board meeting was a refreshed mission, vision, and value statement that I think really also does speak to what our core capabilities should be as an ACO moving forward. Next slide, Ty. This is where we landed with our mission, vision, and values. I'm not going to read it to you because it, it's big enough font that I think all of you can see it on your screen. But just talk about a few of the concepts in it. In terms of our mission, we really felt like one of the first things that had to be forefront was that this is a partnership um, between the ACO and its healthcare providers. And really, um, we are the conduit or the facilitator to help bring many different providers together who are not part of the same organization to work together to drive better care. And the tools that the ACO provides in that is the data and information that they receive from the payers as well as the clinical records and vital as well as the payment reform programs that we can offer on a more systematic basis to our providers. So that's what you see really came out in the mission statement. Vision is really aspirational of where we want to go um, and what we want to be. And we felt like it was really important um, in all the criticisms and discussion about one care is we really do want to be a trusted, equitable healthcare system where everybody is rowing in the same direction to achieve that exceptional outcome for care. And that is going to take time to do that. Um, and we recognize that. And so that's what came out as our vision. The values pieces of it was really driven um, internally by the staff in one care who were very passionate um, about what was important to them and why this work was meaningful to them. And so, as you can see, um, we landed on collaboration, excellence, innovations, equity, communications, and integrity. And there's a lot more detail be, you know, beyond those words that um, people really felt like were important in describing what was important to the staff and why um, people are so passionate about this work. Next slide, Tom. So now I'm going to get into the three main um, core capabilities as well as the strategies of the ACO. And I just want to um, say before I go any deeper into the presentation that this again is a very high level overview of ACO core capability strategies and objectives. We have created as part of our strategic plan uh, work plan that would accompany this that will be public facing so that you'll be able to see a lot of the tactics that will go behind um, all of these, these core capabilities and strategies as we move into the future. So the core capability and focus area number one was really going back to that mission of how OneCare is partnering with disparate provider groups across the state, which does make us very unique in that way that we do have so many organizations that are part of the uh, ACO when usually you're looking at one or two clinically integrated systems forming an ACO. Working together um, to make sure that the care coordination and clinical practices are streamlined, that they're, we're using best practices, and as much as possible to really standardize those. And the way that the ACO can support that is through a lot of the targeted supports and data that we have around care coordination, the training, the best practices, the um, assistance in helping people through certification for becoming a certified care manager, and establishing those clear expectations on what success looks like in certain common critical areas. And what we tried to do as part of this process is to really tie it 
to the all payer model improvement plan and some of the high level as well as tactical goals that the improvement plan is trying to set. And in terms of how this fits in, it's really about that strengthening of integration and improving collaboration among the various healthcare providers so that you don't have duplication or redundancies um, for patients in the healthcare process. Next slide. The second one is talking about really elevating those data and analytics capabilities in order to optimize patient care delivery. When One Care first started off, we did a lot of um, asking providers to kind of self-service, look at information. You know, we provided at elbow support with that. And now what we're looking to do is to talk with the healthcare providers or what are some of the key um, data points that they really need to focus on that might um, be a variance in their you know, select hospital or health service area and optimizing that data to help them around their performance goals that are set and agreed upon at the ACO level. So that's really providing that insightful uh, information to help guide better patient care. And we believe that really, if you think about the all pair model improvement goals, this is really about delivering actionable data so that if a patient ends up in the emergency room or an inpatient admission that they can get an uh, um, immediate trigger to the healthcare provider to let them know that services need, are needed, even if they're not within the four walls of their building. Next slide. And the last one is a big one. It's really around providing a vehicle in a way um, that brings along the federal government a uh, payment system that's more predictable and is tied to value. And, you know, there's, very, there's many different ways in which um, you can tie payment to value. Fixed payments is, of course, one of them. You can also um, have shared savings programs. You can have payments that are tied to certain quality outcomes. So it really is a spectrum. And so what we're looking to do as an organization is really make sure that all of our payments and all of the services um, within OneCare have a value component tied to them so that providers can have that predictable uh, payment stream that they can rely on to best serve their patients. And a few of the objectives really for us is looking at some of the value-based payment contracts that have a fixed payment, uh, Medicare being one of those that really we need to drive and work with the federal government to have a payment that's not um, reconciled at the end of the year because that's not supportive of healthcare reform efforts. And really looking at our current um, independent primary care program that we have, which is for all payers, Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial, and seeing how we can simplify that, align that with federal programs and move it above and beyond independent primary care to be an avenue for even um, FQHCs and hospital own practices to participate. So you have one payment model for uh, all of primary care and tying that back to the high level all payer model improvement goals of really increasing the percentage of Medicare and commercial payments tied to value. And that concludes the high level overview of our strategic focus areas, core capabilities and refreshed mission, vision and values. As I said, um, we have a larger packet that has a lot more details in it that will be um, putting on our website within the next um, seven days or so, getting that cleaned up. And all along the way, we've been talking to all the stakeholders who have provided input to really bring um, them with us and give input along the way of this process so that when we got to the end result, it had, um, it was continuously improved along the way because of people's input and advice on the strategic plan. So we're quite happy with the level of engagement that went into this process. We're happy that it really ties 
to a lot of the national perspective of what makes um, ACO successful. And we're looking forward to the next kind of leg of the journey where we'll be looking at that work plan and executing accordingly. Now I think I'll turn it over to Tom Boris um, to talk about the revised budget. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, so to piggyback on uh, Marissa's intro, we've developed a pretty routine uh, cycle over the last few years where we present our budget to the Green Mountain Care Board uh, in the fall and winter. And that budget inherently has many estimates. We're estimating total cost of care uh, benchmarks, we're estimating attribution, and in some cases, we're anticipating what lands in contract, but, but may or may not actually uh, be included once the negotiations are final. So because of the uh, number of variables in that initial budget submission, I think it's a nice practice to come back here and present um, with a little bit more certainty of, of certain numbers that affect our entire budget model. So that's what we're gonna hear about today. I'm gonna do uh, my best to give a pretty general overview of all the different components of the One Care budget at a higher level, and I'm happy to go deeper. I also, uh, just for those on the call here today, um, for those who want to go deeper, the submitted Excel templates have much more detail than what's presented here in these slides. In some cases, just can't even fit it on a slide in a way that's readable. So I invite you all to look at those uh, materials as well. So getting started on attribution, uh, I'm going to point out a couple things that I find interesting here. I'm going to start by explaining two different perspectives on attribution. If you look on the table, under the green section is what I've labeled starting attribution, and under the blue section, I've labeled average attribution. We often, for the purposes of scale, speak of starting attribution. That's the initial list we receive from payers, and in some cases, that's even before the performance year begins, particularly for the public payers. Our budget, though, is largely built on average attribution, which to some could be translated to member months or the July 1st period. We use that average attribution so as to not overstate uh, financial terms. If, for example, if we're paying a 325 PMPM, if we use that starting number, it means our budget will overestimate or overproject how much we'd actually spend. So when we build our budget, just about all the figures are gonna be uh, referencing back to that average attribution. So with that, uh, I'll come, just highlight a few notes that I find interesting this year. Uh, first, Medicare attribution started high, almost 62,000, a little bit above what we uh, anticipated, but we lost um, over 7,000 lives before the performance here even began. And we usually lose some, but this was a higher number. And the reasons are some of these lives pass away before the year begins, some move to an MA plan uh, or are exempted from the program for other technical reasons through Medicare. So when it translates to the budget, when we think about the starting attribution actually above target, but after factoring in the loss that we uh, anticipated before the year even began, we're actually down about 8,800 lives on an average attribution basis. So you'll see the way that this threads through the budget uh, later on. Medicaid expanded was an interesting one. Attribution came in really strong, uh, about 6,200 above the initial budget. What we learned in 2020, and this was the first, that was the first year of this cohort, was that the attrition rate for this group was much higher than we expected. We anticipated when we built the original budget for 2020 that the attrition rate would be somewhat similar to Medicaid traditional, so those that with the primary care relationship, but we observed through the year that the attrition rate was was much higher. I'm curious, honestly, to see if this continues into 2021, if it was in some way or another uh, affected by the pandemic, um, but that is a change. So numbers came in high, but when it comes to an actual budget figure, it basically washes out and is pretty close to, to what we anticipated. Another big number here is the Blue Cross primary non-risk. These are health plans that uh, have chosen not to put their employees or covered lives into a value-based program with Blue Cross and, and with one care as well. Pretty significant reduction. This has to do with just fewer uh, health plans using Blue Cross primary. Blue Cross is their TPA, not something we could have predicted um, when this initial budget was built. So we don't even get a lot of data on these lives. We don't get any specific data. We only get aggregates. So I, I can't speak to it any more than that. Next is a move into program total cost of care targets, uh, noting that attribution was down in a couple areas, pretty similar themes. 
Public health emergency must be stated as just creating some new and evolving cost patterns. When we built the original budget, we had very little sense of what was going to occur into 2021. And, and I remember having calls with actuaries. There's a lot doing public uh, sessions to explain the results. And you could listen to two back to back and one would say 2021 was going to have low costs and the other was going to would say that 2021 would have high costs due to pent up demand or kind of catch up. We budgeted in the initial round based on you know, status quo models, really not knowing what was going to occur into 2021. As it turns out, many of the targets came in a little bit lower than we anticipated. So you see that it is down in Medicare. Uh, a large portion of that reduction is due to those 8000 lives with each uh, Medicare beneficiary having such a high spend per life. It consumes um, more than half of that uh, reduction. And as you go on through, it's really where the targets uh, as set by the payers landed that dictated the lower total cost of care. This specifically doesn't have an impact on one care operations. It's really just the total cost of care accountability figures. Uh, so no concerns from an operational standpoint of one care the, as a business entity. I've also supplied a slide with the pay, uh, provider payment breakdown um, with fee for service and then the other three, uh, four components being the fixed payment. 34% uh, is has been converted to a fixed payment uh, model. Uh, that's unchanged in the original budget submission. Apologies for the redactions, a little bit of the nature of this business here. Uh, but again, flowing through a programmatic risk uh, overall and reward is down in alignment with total cost of care changes. So generally risk and reward is linked to that total cost of care on a percentage basis. So as, as those total cost of care target numbers go down, so too does aggregate risk. Public payer programs, Medicaid and Medicare, have adjustments related to the pandemic that are important to note. Uh, COVID-19 episodes are removed, so if somebody's hospitalized for COVID-19, that uh, that hospitalization as well as the following month of care is deleted from the actual spend. And the max downside risk is prorated down for each month the public health emergency is in effect. Uh, this uh, at present has been extended through July, so effectively seven months of the year uh, will be prorated down. When we look at the numbers in aggregate, the downside estimate uh, based on these revised figures here is just shy of 16 million, 15.6 uh, in fact. And on the upside, it is 16.8. The difference between those two, the upside being higher is that one program is an upside only, so there's no downside, but there is some upside potential. The bottom table, I've taken the opportunity to uh, just calculate out the current prorations based on the duration of the public health emergency through uh, today's knowledge. So basically the Medicare and Medicaid programs, the maximum risk that would be owed by any of the uh, by one care um, is, is now down, uh, prorated down through July. So in total, uh, really the maximum downside risk about six and a half million if that public health emergency is extended again, they typically go in 90 day blocks. We'd see that amount uh, reduce accordingly. That does not change the upside. So we retain the opportunity for shared savings uh, without any effect of this proration figure. Risk sharing model, just a quick update, really no substantial changes. Last year's big evolution was uh, trying to expand accountability and opportunity more broadly across the network. Historically, it was uh, fully the responsibility of the hospitals on both the downside and the upside, and uh, as a means to help uh, improve the focus on performance to more of the participants in the network, we have now implemented a $1.50 PMPM contribution, which can either be processed monthly or deferred uh, with a potential for invoice at the end, of the end of the year to all attributing primary care, this includes FQHCs, independents, and, and hospital employed as well. And then we also offer uh, these participants $1.50 PMPM of shared savings if earned. So they have the first uh, swath of any shared savings earned it goes right to primary care, and then the hospitals pick up the balance um, from that point on. In the table, I've broken down the different components. Uh, you can see the primary care share on the downside, about 2.4 million. The risk bearing entity being the hospitals, 13.1. Uh, and there's that total risk of uh, about 15.6 million. Similar pattern on the upside. 
risk, uh, total risk breakdown by HSA. Uh, I've summarized it a little bit here just to fit it on the slide. There is a breakdown by payer and HSA in the submitted budget templates. I uh, invite you all to look there. I've also taken the liberty on this tab to break down non-hospital PCP share of any downside risk versus hospital PCP, and then lastly, the risk-bearing entity. Because some hospitals employ primary care, they have risk and reward opportunity both for their primary care component and for their uh, hospital component as their risk-bearing entity. So you can see about 1.3 million of the downside risk um, and, and reward effectively goes to non-hospital PCP, 1.3 one to hospital PCP, and then 13 to the risk bearing entity really is the hospital. In terms of scope, 85% still lives with the, the hospitals, the risk bearing entity. So the, the majority of risk still lives there, but I think adding the uh, financial accountability to all primary care is an important step. This is a big evolution in 2020's, uh, 2021's budget was quality accountability. <laughs> Um, just to bring everyone up to present, one of, one of the strategies that we employed to really help manage hospital participation fees was to shift quality accountability to settlement. Some of this was COVID related. Everyone was, all the, all the participants were under some financial stress, but this is also a, a strategy for long-term sustainability. Historically, in the model that we operated with, with the payers, we had to pre-fund quality accountability into the value-based incentive fund. And the means to do that is to add it to hospital dues. As our programs grew so aggressively over the last few years, uh, the amount that was being added onto the hospital participation fees to pre-fund this value-based incentive fund became um, substantial. And it was resulting in aggressive dues growth over time. So what we uh, endeavored to do in the 2021 uh, budget and the negotiations with payers was move some quality accountability to settlement. And this is actually a little bit of a more traditional model where basically you, you can earn shared savings or owe losses, but your quality score affects how much you, you can get or owe. So if you earn shared savings, but had a really poor quality score, you wouldn't actually be entitled to those shared savings, for example. Uh, a little bit more of a traditional model, you see that in the, the MSSP program, in fact, and that's the way the Medicare uh, program that OneCare has participated in the last, for the last few years technically works. Where this landed is uh, Medicaid ended up splitting it in half. Half is pre-funded, half moves to settlement. You see that on the slide there, but we were successful in the commercial program negotiations to move it all to settlement in the back end. What it means, about 2.2 million is pre-funded. That's a more palatable number. 6.3 is what I call at risk at settlement, meaning that if we got a zero quality score across all programs, uh, $6.3 million is, is technically at risk. And then total quality accountability, when you add them both up, about $8.5 million. Just for reference, in 2020, uh, quality accountability was $5.6 million. The problem being, it all needed to be pre-funded. All right, shifting a little bit more into the budget for the One Care entity itself, talking about revenues here. No major changes in the overall payer contribution model. Many have some sort of a PMPM -PM contribution uh, that will flow through to the participants in the network. No significant changes. The numbers just will move with attribution. Uh, in the state funding for DSR and, and health information technology, there's a little bit of a juggle, no net change. But in the original budget, we anticipated $3.9 million of DSR funding and $0 of health information technology funding. Um, at the time, it was believed that those HIT funds were unavailable for 2021. Fast forward to today, uh, some HIT funding is available. Uh, we've now budgeted a million dollars of that, but it's offset by the DSR. So DSR is down to 2.9. So think of those two as just a trade of source funds for the from the state side, but in total the same 3.9 million uh, we have yet to formally contract with the state for the DSR funds, but all uh, signals are green uh, as far as, as I'm aware regarding the DSR funding, making it through the legislative process. Uh, I'll just note the Blueprint Self-Management uh, was an initiative that we had planned uh, back when the original budget was being designed. This ultimately did not launch, so that's, that line has just been uh, deleted. 
Uh, lastly, on this slide, deferred revenue. We anticipated using uh, some a little bit more of these funds in 2020, but the pandemic just caused everyone to focus um, on protecting their patients, protecting their employees. So a lot of the projects we had uh, planned for 2020 just got delayed and deferred. So it's really a timing shift where more of these will occur in 2021 rather than 2020. Population health management investments breakdown. Uh, I'll just note it was nearly impossible to fit it on one slide. There is a sources and uses table in the budget templates that show for each of these different investment areas, as well as our operations, which revenue streams or funding streams support the, the different projects. Um, but in total, main changes came from attribution shifts. So you see the base one care Vermont PM PM down about 1.2, fully based on attribution. Um, the self-management program payments, uh, that program did not launch. Therefore, the, the expenses that would have gone to the network uh, deleted accordingly. And then, as I mentioned before, in the specialist innovation, some timing related to the public health emergency, just delaying or deferring some projects out into 2021. Operating costs, we did go through the budget uh, in detail. I'd say there's there were not uh, substantial shifts. When we did our second budget in 2020, many of the changes were designed to be flowed through pretty seamlessly to 2021. Some of the same question marks about what our return to the office configuration looks like remains as we continue to evaluate that, just like many other businesses. Wages and Fringe just made a few updates for hiring dates, some positions we anticipated to have on board by now, and they haven't been, so just adjusted that accordingly. In the contracted space, legal has been a hot expense um, of late, so we've uh, adjusted that accordingly as well. In the occupancy, uh, we were able to reduce the rent expense for the business, so we've updated that uh, figure also. I'll note that we had really three different versions of our operating costs here. We submitted an original budget of 16.1. Uh, during that process, uh, became aware that the amount we budgeted for the Green Mountain Care Board bill back was too high. So we updated that and made the approved budget column reflective of the reduced bill back number. So that's where you get from 16.1 to 15.9. The budget, while we have juggled categories a little bit, uh, remains unchanged. Participation fee breakdown, a lot of numbers on this tab or slide, I'm sorry. Uh, shows a very similar story, but there's a, an important point I do want to make. Um, starting the left, original budget we submitted, approved budget reflects that Green Mountain Care Board bill back update accordingly. The revised budget uh, has 15 million 56,000 for uh, participation fees. So relating back to the original budget, up 120,000, which when you spread it out, uh, isn't terribly substantial across participants uh, versus the revised up a little bit more. The participation fee amount is really the most variable component of our budget and depending on attribution across programs, other revenues we're able to secure from third parties, the state, um, uh, et cetera, that can affect the, the dues amount accordingly. So think of it in this way, if we were to get a lot more funding from a third party source, the offset is a reduction in hospital dues. So there's a, there are many moving parts in there, but in general, um, it ended up being pretty close. I was reasonably happy with the result, but all of the changes, ups and downs, are really due to attribution, shifts between what, what funding streams come into one care and then what is therefore left for the, for the hospitals to pick up the tab on. Some are up and some are down as over the years, we've developed a, a methodology for allocating those participation fees across hospitals that um, contemplates which hospitals have employed primary care and which don't. Otherwise, the net cost would be very substantial to a, a, a hospital that doesn't have employed primary care, where one that has primary care gets a lot of funds back through one care program. So on a net basis, we have a much lower cost. So over the years, we've worked closely with our network to develop a model and that any shifts in attribution between the HSAs or between the hospitals will result in some ups and downs on a per hospital basis. Uh, again, uh, this is a highly summarized view. There's a much more robust uh, income statement, uh, profit and loss statement included in the Excel templates. We've done some work. Uh, it's been a nice collaborative process with the Green Mountain Care Board staff 
to evolve the templates and make it a little bit more clear. Um, I'll speak to it at a high level in terms of the revenues. A lot of what we call revenue in our budget is completely external to one care in the sense that, yes, we're accountable, but we never actually touch the dollars. So that has been uh, converted into its own category, external total cost of care. Note that is down. That's just the total cost of care targets going down. Contract revenue relates to all the contracts with the payers, um, mostly a couple small ones here and there uh, in addition. But that will also include the, the fixed payment component. We do touch those dollars. So we included that in a bucket that actually does flow through One Care Vermont. That $68 million uh, reduction is uh, linked directly to the total cost of care and the lower uh, fixed payment amounts accordingly. Other changes are relatively uh, small, just other revenue and hospital participation fees that we spoke of. Very similar uh, breakdown on the expense side, the external healthcare costs, we don't touch those. The PHM program expenses, we call the fixed payment uh, part of that internally often. This really, we, it is a tool for us to invest in population health management and see that row accordingly. And then operating expenses, again, unchanged from what I am thinking of as the approved budget version. In all uh, circumstances, net income is set to be zero. Uh, balance sheet, relatively unchanged, really. Um, this is a balance sheet forecast or projection of what December 31st, 2021 will look like. Uh, largely, those assumptions have not changed. We're, we're such a heavy pass-through organization that just, just about everything on the balance sheet is a timing-related component. What do we think our fixed payment for Medicaid will be? They pay us actually a month in advance, typically. How much will be there on December 31st is, is kind of the, the guess. What do we think is going to be outstanding for any payables or receivables? Um, so really not any significant changes in the line items. One area that is um, noteworthy is in the equity section. With our 501c3 change, uh, no longer are the retained earnings uh, booked in the same fashion. Typically, the way that that worked through the partnership accounting model was that any equity was really split half and half the Dartmouth and UVM uh, to organize the business in a manner that is compliant and consistent with the 501c3 uh, status. We're changing this row to be net assets. Those assets really belong to one care um, in total and don't flow through to the founders in the same way they historically have. So much more consistent with what you would see on a nonprofit um, uh, balance sheet. And that's the high level. Happy to entertain uh, questions. Thank you, Tom. Do we have questions from the board? This is Robin. I have a couple questions. Go ahead, Robin. Okay. Um, hi, Tom and Vicki. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so I had a question around the Medicare attribution. Do you have any sense of how much Medicare Advantage is driving that versus the other issues you rattled off? It is a component. Um, we can we can supply a, a breakdown to you, and I haven't prepared that today. But yes, we've noticed an increase in Medicare Advantage uh, in in this over the last two years. Really, it seems to be a much um, more present option. For Vermonters in terms of their healthcare coverage plan. That'd be great. It'd just be nice to understand a little bit. I mean, certainly some of that could have been the pandemic, I guess, or you know, who knows what, but it just would be nice to kind of understand why that was such a big drop this year. Sure thing. Um, I was wondering if there were any substantial or substantive changes to the commercial programs in terms of the programmatic aspects. Um, since we last saw you in the fall? Uh, I'd say at a high level, the uh, answer is no. Um, really, I think the idea that we implemented was to, in 2020, when we're all kind of going day by day through the pandemic, find a way to make the program as kind of low risk as possible for participants. And we largely kept that in similar form and function rolling into 2021 as uncertainty still revolves around us. Um, as we move forward, I think we want to uh, start working it back towards a more traditional looking and feeling model, uh, just as we as a uh, society start to get back to a little bit more of a normal existence. 
Great. Um, and I did notice um, in the uh, budget template document that you submitted in the full accountability tag, their um, MVP had two different breakouts. One was PHM and one was an other, and then Cigna had some consulting revenues. And I wonder if you could just explain that a little bit. I didn't sure. remember that distinction from the fall. So it may be my faulty memory. No, no, it's okay. Um, we, um, I don't think I'm going to be saying anything that gets us out of uh, or sideways with the commercial payers, but we initially worked with MVP to develop a model where they contributed to the care coordination program. Uh -huh. And uh, it was kind of a, an in and out. They would contribute during the year, but it became a healthcare expense or cost at the settlement. So kind of came out in the wash at the end of the day. For administrative efficiency, we agreed to just go do away with that portion of it. It wasn't a tremendous amount of money um, based on the size of the population. Okay. And then what's the Cigna? Cigna is it's not we uh, not directly with Cigna, but um, we have uh, had a staff person on board that helps with the uh, some participants in our network that were, that are in a Cigna collaborative accountable care program. It was kind of a similar thing where they paid us, we have supplied the employee. We decided to transition that work entirely back to the participants engaged in that program rather than having it kind of flow back and forth between us. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Um, and then also programmatically, I was wondering if um, there's any sense yet about restarting uh, some of the programs that were put on hold, understandably, with COVID. And I know we're all just starting to come out, so you may not know that yet. But if you had any sense of timing and when you might restart programs, um, if you think that's likely in 2021. I, I can speak for us at One Care. We're looking to get back into all the same things we were interested in doing prior to the pandemic. Um, we can supply some sort of a little template or, or update on the specific initiatives and their timing, if that would be helpful to you. You may be doing that already in the reporting manual, so certainly if it's duplicative, I was just curious about yeah. that, because um, certainly that would be good news. Um, and then my last question was, um, on the strategic plan, um, and I act, my question actually stems from the longer PowerPoint document, um, which has more of a time frame for certain objectives. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more, to, Vicky, to um, your timing around commercial versus Medicare in terms of moving towards fixed payments. And also, um, you may know we had a presentation a couple weeks ago around FQHC participation. And if you had any sense in, about FQHC uh, payment models that might be in the offing, that might be a preview for 2022. But I was just curious about that, given that we just heard about that. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Robin. Um, yeah, our first push is really towards the Medicare program. That's where the preponderance of our lies and dollars flow. And so moving the federal government in that direction and getting a program with them, it's much easier to get the rest of the state to follow in that direction. So that's where we'd like to focus our efforts is getting the Medicare to a truly fixed payment approach. They do offer that with other programs. And so I think it's going to be a discussion about how much um, risk and reward that we're able to take as a network. And so that's also going to take some time to make sure that the delivery system is really assembled um, to make those those necessary um, you know, adjustments to both risk and reward. Ultimately, we need to get to higher risk corridors than we're at right now to be able to continue to fund um, all these investments that we're making because currently as it stands, the amount of investments are far exceeding the about, you know, the amount of um, shared savings opportunity. And that's just not kind of a sustainable option for us. As we move through the CPR the, for the independence this year in a simplification process, our goal is to broaden that out 
to FQHCs as well um, as hospital-owned practices. So as part of this process this year, we want to look at what are some of those steps that we could take to be able to have that offering come 20, what year are we in now? 2023, so that we would have our standard program in 2022 that would be simplified, right, and a little different. And then um, we would have a broader offering in 2023. I think we're often um, caught up in this contracting cycle in that we have to have our contracts out to providers by June to be able to have them signed by September. So that means a lot of things have to be known by June and we're just not in that space for the FQHCs or the primary care hospital owned at this point in time. So it's a little bit of that. So Tom um, and Derek Rains, who's our new director of uh, payment reform is going to be working to assemble the CPR practices um, and designing that later on, well, next month. I think I got all your questions. Did I miss anything, Robin? Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Um, the okay. only thing I would note, which is obviously my opinion, I'm one of five, um, but I think the board is going to be very interested in seeing the commercial programs evolve simultaneously with Medicare, at least I am, uh, because I think that otherwise you get into some strange uh, dynamics um, in terms of payment policy and uh, mm -hmm. potentially putting too much pressure on commercial uh, premium payers. So I just a heads up that I think, uh, at least from me, you'll be getting a little pushback on that timing because I think we need to be moving forward on both fronts. But again, that's my, just one of five. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I do think that's a good discussion to have and probably one to have with the payers too because they need to be able to operationalize it. Right now they offer um, a reconciled AIPVP and we're not interested. Um, and continuing that approach. So really it would mean getting to a state that's truly fixed um, that we could take on. Great, thank you. You're welcome. I just had one question on the um, the risk reserve chart, where I guess it's prorated down for the downside risk, but um, the upside upside opportunity remains in full. Is that is that the case? I mean, because it it appears we there should be a bit of upside potentially. Yeah, that's that follows the national Medicare model that they implemented in 2020, where they. Um, they limited upside to 5%, and it's funny to say it that way because 5% feels like a lot, but some ACOs were at a 15% you know, risk corridor. It's an option. So they limited it down to 5% to prevent, I guess, from windfall shared savings to ACOs across the country. And alongside that, added the proration of downside risk for the months of the public health emergency. So I think through their lens, they did both upside and downside. For us, it ends up being more of a downside benefit mm -hmm. uh, and upside remains unchanged. Okay, All right, good. Yeah, thank you. And thank you both for the presentation. Sure thing. Thank you. Other board questions? Yeah, I, I have a couple. I want to thank uh, Tom and Vicki for uh, this presentation and, and all the work that went into the strategic plan. Um, you know, my kind of kind of long-term sense of things is that the, uh, you know, a lot of people I think, or some people don't appreciate the the work that it has taken over the early years of the ACO just to establish itself and create the infrastructure, you know, that, that, that is now, um, you know, uh, not mature certainly, but is seasoned. And, uh, you know, there are some areas where the success uh, uh, of the ACO is clear on the ground. Uh, there was an article in Vermont Digger a while back about the Southern Vermont uh, Hospital and their transition um, in terms of outpatient versus inpatient uh, caseload. And, and the folks down there give the ACO uh, a lot of credit because it helped them kind of weather the transition from fee-for-service to a, a fixed, fixed payment model. 
and has really changed care down in, in, in that area. Um, but as we kind of go forward, for me, um, uh, you know, maybe being too simple, but, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the strategic um, report where it says, um, you know, increase uh, on slide eight, it's, you don't have to go there, but it says increase the proportion of value-based contracts that have true fixed payments in 2022 and beyond. And my mind immediately goes to, well, what is the proportion now? What is the tipping point, which is a question we asked in the last um, uh, budget process, and what is the goal for 2023? So that uh, when we're talking to folks about fixed prospective payments, especially true ones, you know, we 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 know what the plan is. Um, and for me as a board member, knowing what the plan and understanding that you're just a portion of the pie, but understanding where you want to, where you are and where you want to go uh, is information that I would think would be helpful in rate review in, in the hospital budgets. So, and and, and the same for um, the, 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 the language in the plan that talks about increasing proportion of independent primary care practices in true capitated programs. But, you know, there's no, uh, th th there's nothing that I've seen yet that let me know where we are and, and I understand that it's taken a few years to get to where we are, but where we are now and, and, and where we want to go. So that's, that's just kind of, a, you know, a, a, a comment going forward, to, you know, looking, looking at, at the next budget process. Um, another issue that uh, I think maybe is some significance, you know, is the, in the appropriations bill that just passed, there was a section, you know, that uh, called for the review of the benchmark plan. And it looks like you have about 22,000 folks uh, of attributed lives, you know, um, uh, that are uh, subject to the benchmark plan. And so there's going to be a review of that uh, the first time it's been done, I think, since 2013 or 2014. And I would uh, would think, given your analytic capabilities or in history now, that you might be uh, able to help inform that process as to how our benchmark plan might be changed to better emphasize um, uh, um, population health and, uh, and our preventive care approaches. Um, it's a it's a one time opportunity. I think they have to have a report out by January 1st of 2022. And uh, I would think AC the ACO would would want to be engaged in that given given your capabilities to uh, uh, profile, you know, the, the healthcare system. Um, so that's that's just the uh, uh, you know I guess my question is were you aware of that section in the appropriations bill? Uh, I, I personally, no. No. Yeah. Well, it just it, it's a section E two twenty seven, um, and you, you'll see its significance relative to the the folks that you have in the in 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 your attributed lives that are are in the QHP program. Um, another uh, question I have and is uh, <clears throat> a couple of weeks back, we had uh, Michael Baylett from uh, the Baylor Company, which um, you know, has a, a long history and kind of uh, in, engagement at different levels uh, in Vermont. And one of the points that he made uh, in terms of the uh, uh, strategic, you know, the, 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 his strategic report and referencing um, qualities of a successful ACO. He said that one his his top uh, point was that they are characterized um, by quote moving care from high cost to low cost sites, e.g., away from hospitals. That was his top observation about successful ACOs. And I'm just wondering what your reaction uh, to that observation might be. Yeah, it's not, it's not surprising one to me. Um, it goes along with that right care, right place, right time kind of cliche that is thrown around pretty often. I, I think I've seen or at least heard from a number of different ACOs. They all have a different strategy that they play. But generally speaking, there are maybe I'll call it two camps. One is in that vein, which is really care. Um, 
almost referral management. How do you make sure that the patients land in the right place, go to home health when they're when it's appropriate to do so, rather than staying in an inpatient setting, and really coordinating that from a um, like a referral standpoint. Others go after um, uh, savings through population health of really trying to help improve the health of the population, wellness, and really using primary care as the quarterback to do that. We're more in the latter. I think we really use primary care to be the one responsible for taking care of their patients in a holistic way and ensuring that they're getting the care in the right place rather than having one care with a team of people that kind of point and say, go here, go there. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, if we're wildly successful in this venture, it is the hospital revenues that would um, suffer, I'll say, uh, at least for them. So the couple strategies to help keep them really engaged in it and participate in the programs, fixed payments, get into that true unreconciled fixed payment where if you can avoid an admission, uh, there's every financial incentive to do so. And over time, start to redeploy resources to upstream services rather than inpatient. And then giving the hospitals a, a reasonable stake at the shared savings as well. And I, you know, I said at the beginning it was really important to broaden accountability. The and there is also giving the, the hospitals some um, uh, opportunity for shared savings too, because they're the ones that would see less revenue in their ED and inpatient, which is good, but it keeps them incentivized. And I've spoken to other ACOs that are just primary care, which is kind of your more typical ACO. And to them, the hospitals are the enemy. It's a very adversarial relationship where the hospitals will look at the ACO activities as you're a threat to our revenues and having a more uh, diverse network that includes hospitals and primary care and home health, et cetera, I think enables us to really take on that second strategy of really working on the health of the population and, and putting the providers in control. I, I would just add on to what Tom said at the end about us being a very unique accountable care organization in that we do have providers that cross the spectrum of care. And if you even look at one of the Medicare benefit enhancements, it's that three-day waiver. So that's avoiding people going to the hospital prior to entering a skilled nursing facility. Vermont is third in the country um in leveraging that waiver so i would say that um our healthcare providers have really embraced this work of really working together as a system for the betterment of the patient now it can't be at the expense of a hospital going out of business because that certainly doesn't benefit the community if they have no place to receive their services in the future so i think it's recognizing that one care and its provider networks are really ahead um, in that area mm -hmm. well thank you for that my, my 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 closing observation is that um as we go forward that the, the strategic plan was well written i mean it was interesting to read uh, easily understandable but there wasn't a lot of of meat there in terms of 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 information like what what's the proportion of FPP that we have now that one could grab onto, and uh, so as we go forward, um, given that the ACO is a more seasoned organization now than it was say two or three years ago, you know that that we begin to populate that strategic strategic plan with metrics and data that allow people to understand the story and the, and the benefits of the ACO and that they don't get lost in 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 this overall complexity of our healthcare system. So uh, thank you very much for, for that. Thank you, Tom. Other members of the board? Sure, I'll jump in here. Um, and actually, it's great to go last because some of my questions were already asked. Uh, but just to jump on, Tom, to the answer to Tom's question um, about sort of the low-value care and, uh, you know, uh, the comments from the consultant that we heard from a couple weeks ago about uh, high-performing ACOs thinking about referrals to lower cost centers. And I guess I would just say that, I, you know, um, in your strategic plan, there's a discussion about uh, courage to cha challenge existing systems. And there's, you know, comments about best practices and clinical practices. And we just heard from Mike Fisher about some stories out there about some duplicative services and, and low value care that's, that's adding cost to the system with, without adding any quality to the system. Um, and so I would just hope that, you know, your approach would be two pronged. Um, and also thinking about how to eliminate, you know, some low value care from the system. 
Uh, so I would just add that to my hope that there is there is room for that in your strategic plan. Um, my question, I have two questions I think that are still lurking. One is um, you've changed your financial accountability, you know, with your risk sharing model this year, and you also changed the quality accountability with the settlement now dependent on quality score. So I was wondering, I know you're just you know, in it right now, but I'm wondering how that was received by your um, networks. If you can just speak a little bit to the changes that you made in this budget cycle and how it's being received. You know, generally, I think it's being received okay. I mean, to to start at the risk sharing model, um, we are now kind of in a more kind of uh, pro rata way distributing shared savings to HSAs. That I think has been well received in the context of it makes sense during the pandemic, but I, I think there's also a shared recognition that what's lost in that is some more localized accountability. And, you know, the way I, I think of One Care along its journey is we came out with a pretty complex model in the beginning, honestly, and this in a way is an opportunity. I mean, the pandemic was the catalyst for it, which, you know, I never wish for, but we now have a pretty simple model, and it's a, almost in a way a clean slate to start building accountability back out in a more thoughtful way. So the dollar fifty PMPM is part of that, and the value-based incentive fund is part of that. Starting to get back into a model that I think is easier to understand for our participants, really effective. I want the whatever financial models we develop to be effective in driving the right activities and behaviors, and. Uh, in a way, I think this is an opportunity to kind of reset and get going again in a little bit more of a methodical way. Um, and then, you know, along the way, it's there's always an interesting dynamic. Some, I'm not sure anybody loves the dollar fifty accountability being spread, but a lot understand it. Uh, I mean, the first word in ACO is accountable, and um, I, I think there's kind of a shared understanding that it needs to be there and it's an important part of this evolution, even though it's tough and the timing's tough too. I mean, doing it during a pandemic was just bad luck, honestly, but um, important nonetheless. Okay, okay, thank you. And my second question was about the DSR funding. Um, I understand, you know, the, the 3.9 was what you expected, 2.9 is what you got. It doesn't to some degree matter for this budget cycle because you also had an unexpected 1 million from HIT. So at the end of the day, you know, you had the same amount, but I'm wondering if there are any insights um, you gleaned, you know, in terms of you, your below expectations on the DSR, what does that mean for 2022? And, you know, is there any remaining money left in HIT for next year? I'm just sort of wondering what you learned from this cycle that might actually inform next year's budget, even though I know we're not talking about next year's budget, but you know, Funding sources in the future, learnings. You're muted, Vicky. It's a great question. I would say that we, what we've learned from this, is that there needs to be a predictable funding source for investments moving forward. That um, going from year to year doesn't create the type of predictability that's needed for the healthcare providers to know that programs are going to exist into the future. And so I think we have a couple of choices in front of us. Either we have to learn how to live uh, from the shared savings opportunity and cap our investments at that, or there has to be a conscious decision on behalf of the state to um, invest some money upfront to help primary care, behavioral health, uh, mental health providers, and others um, really get prepared to enter into value-based contracts. So I think we have two choices. We can either choose to make some predictable investments upfront, um, or the ACO needs to look at what its potential is for savings opportunity and base its investments off from that. Did part of your strategic plan do any kind of analysis on what types and value of, you know, or the level of investment that would be needed to really make delivery system reform change, what the ask might have to be going forward? Is there any, is that a part of your strategic planning exercise? We have started that. I would say that's more in the execution piece of it, um, but we did have discussions that 
we could put out there what we really would need um, to be able to make this work. I think when the all payer model originally was looked at, there was a lot of money available to uh, invest. That money did not come to fruition uh, as anticipated. And so we have to think about um, that moving forward. Great, thank you. Those are my questions, Kevin. Thank you, Jess. Does any board member have any follow-up questions? I just have one um, based on sort of your dialogue with Jess. I'm one of the, and I'll just make it as a comment. You know, you can think about it in in terms of your strategic planning. But you know, I, as I've talked about many times before, there's there's kind of different pieces to payment and delivery system reform. One of which is provider readiness and the ability um to ensure that providers have the technical expertise to do the actual on the ground delivery system reform change which is going to solve the problem like my what mike fisher brought up today yeah. uh, so i'm just curious when you're thinking about what level of investment to think about that in terms of uh not just investment to the aco but investment in technical assistance because it looks like that's the piece that I'm still feeling could be missing. I don't understand whose job it is to ensure that the technical assistance is there in our not not with the ACO, but in the in the whole system, whether it's the state that it could be the state, it could be the ACO, it could be the provider level. I think any could work, but mm -hmm. that still feels like a gap potentially to me. Yeah. I would say, Robin, we really tried to get at that in a longer document that I think you have a copy of that looks at what are the ACO core capabilities versus what's the network core capabilities? Because those are the direct care providers that are on the ground trying to deliver the service. So when I talk about investments, I don't mean investments in the ACO, I mean investments in the providers, like the primary care in incentive fund that we give for the CPR. Like how do those investments get made in a way that's strong enough and sustainable enough to help them move to a truly capitated system that they know is actually that's the direction they're moving versus like, well, it might be this way for a year, but then we might change our mind, right? And we'll go into a different direction. So to make it a sustainable long-term investment for them. So it's really on the provider side that I'm talking about making the investment and not on the ACO side. Thanks. Okay, at this time, we're gonna open it up for public comment. Uh, if members of the public have comment, please raise your hand, or if you're not on the Teams meeting, um, just speak up, but I will call those with their hands raised first. And I'm going to start with... I'm gonna start with Ham Davis and followed by Mike Fisher and Walter Carpenter, so Ham. Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me now? I'm sorry, that was my fault. Yeah, we can hear you now, Ham. Yeah. Um, you're so lucky. We are the um <laughs> I'd like to go back to Tom Pelham's question. Um one of his questions, one and one I think that didn't get answered, but I think is absolutely critical, and I think it's one that the chairman has talked about on two or three occasions over the last several months. And that is, I think we need to know where we are right now insofar as the actual number of, uh, of fixed price contracts, prospective, real prospective contracts, and how much ground that is covering. Because I think, because the, the whole thesis of healthcare reform is to shift from, from people service to capitation. And, I, 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 so I really want to know what Tom's question is. We've had different numbers. I mean, the numbers we I've seen numbers as low as two percent and as high as twenty percent. Um, uh, somebody said two percent. AHS said no, two percent wasn't right, but they didn't say what was right. So I'd like to know how much. How, what have we got right now that we've actually accomplished? That's got the that's got the renew got the new reform payment structure in place. I think a second one, if I be so just to get it all at once, is I think Tom's question also included, that's Tom Pelham's question, also included where he thinks the tipping point is. 
we're nowhere near the tipping point, but the tipping point is very interesting. It's probably, in my judgment, somewhere around 40. Um, but uh, on paper, anyway, it's supposed to be around 70. So could we get the questions to, uh, I'd like to get the, those, that answer to, an, I'd like to get answers to those particular questions that Tom asked. Thank you. I would just like to offer Chair Mullen that we do have a breakdown. Um, there is a national consultant group that looks at by value-based payment type, because again, it's a it's a continuum. So having fixed perspective payment might be a gold standard, but it's not the only value-based payment. So we have $1.4 billion in value-based payment. That's one cares number. Um, that's probably close to, I'd look to Tom, half of what would be eligible to be in value-based payment care. But we do have it by value-based payment type, at least for one cares book of business. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy to respond to that too. I mean, the, the question hit on a couple different components. I'll try to break them apart a little bit. Um, Moving away from fee for service isn't uh, synonymous with um, value based healthcare payments. And Medicare, through you know, MACRA and all the evolutions it's made over the last few years, has basically said we're now paying providers for high value care, high quality care, but it's still reimbursed on a fee for service basis. So, it, with that in mind, Vicki's 100% right. We have uh, over a billion dollars of healthcare in a value-based uh, concept whereby providers are rewarded for uh, high quality care that lives within a total cost of care target and with our very progressive model we'll pay back uh, if if that target is exceeded in terms of uh, and i'm referencing a, a green Mountain care board uh, presentation about how much of the total healthcare cost for vermonters is even kind of underneath the all-payer model umbrella somewhere in the two and a half billion dollar range so we're near 50% of all Vermont, uh, Vermonters healthcare costs being in a value-based healthcare arrangement. I don't have national data, but I'll just speculate at the risk of doing so, that it, that's a pretty high penetration rate uh, relative to other states in the, in the country. It's, it's growing nationally, but um, that's, that's a pretty high penetration rate to me. Um, the second question I think gets at the fixed payment and is more of on a provider level. So if I'm a hospital or a primary care or home health shop, what's what's the tipping point there for a fixed payment that that changes the way I you know do business? And that's that's a tough one for one care to on, answer honestly because we don't know how much of their business is outside of the one care programs. But it'd be a great question to ask providers. What's what's that tipping point where you really can start doing business differently. Um, in my past experience, uh, payment reforms was, were often more like program by program. So just getting one program switched over was a huge win, even if it was only 1% of your total work. Um, I'm not sure if that same paradigm holds true for a hospital or a primary care shop. Can I follow up on that, Kevin, or, or am I done? Go ahead, Jim. I understand that there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. When, when uh, <clears throat> CMMI talked about it initially, they had four levels of reform and they steadily went up the ladder until they get the real fixed price contracts. And you can speculate about, well, you got, you got, you got two level threes and two level twos and three level threes, and you can make judgments, and that's fine, about what you think it will take to get reform actually done. But it seems to me that it's a perfectly fair question to ask, the, to ask what is the actual numbers that we have today on level four? Level four in the CMMI structure, okay, is a fixed payment contract where there's no more money. And we have had that in Medicaid, but we have not had a dime of it in Medicare, and we have not had a dime of it from the, the from the uh, from private insurers. So so I, I, I think at a minimum we should be able to it should be knowable. What is the actual number that is in fixed price contract? You can interpret it any way you want. Okay. But my question is. What's the fixed price number?
it, again, got to break it down a little bit here. I think that category four, I'm going off memory, is more like your Medicare Advantage type model where the commercial insurer gets a set amount of money, they pay claims, and that's it. Uh, we don't have it. We're not a, a Medicare Advantage plan, so we don't have that level. I think the closest piece to the true fixed price component is within our total value based healthcare contracts. As long as you're within that risk corridor, uh, that's a fixed price. I mean, you reconcile back to it. If you agree the PMPM is 250 and it comes in at 260, you pay it back as long as it's within the risk corridor. It gets a little complicated if you go outside of that because the payer does pick some money back, back up. But within the risk corridor, I'd say in aggregate for Vermonters that attribute uh, all the 1.2 or 1.4 billion is in that construct in some way or another. The piece I think that you're getting at, Ham, is more of the, the Medicaid fixed payment, for example, which is a true cap payment uh, that we pay to hospitals and primary care. We get what we get from that. There's no uh, more or no less money uh, at the end of the day. And if the uh, actual healthcare would have cost a lot more on the fee for service equivalent um, basis. There's no more money. If it costs less, there's no more or less money either. So that Medicaid piece is probably what you're getting at. Um, exact, that, that is exactly what I'm getting at. Can we say what that percentage, what that number is against the against the universe? That is my point. It's the only place that I can see it working is in the Medicaid contract and not the whole Medicaid. But the Medicaid contracts where the care is being given within network, not out of network. There's a bucket for out of network that you can't control at all. Now, but that's the number. That's that's exactly right. What is that number that is within Medicare where there's no more money? Uh, within Medicaid, the fixed payment is in the $180 million ballpark. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. For Med Medicaid. Yeah, it's about one hundred and eighty million dollars. Thank you. That, that's the answer to my question. I don't know whether Tom likes it, but I liked it. Thank you. OK, Mike Fisher. Uh, thanks. My question is much more nitty gritty, I think. Um, uh, Tom, I, I'm trying to um, looking at the the uh, relationship between slides 10 and 11, the attribution slide and the cost slides, I think you described that the dynamic for the cost slide was both the reduced attribution and reduced utilization. Can you pull that apart a little bit more? You, you provide some numbers for reduced attribution, but can you pull apart a little bit more what, uh, what the reduced utilization was? Uh, it's, I, I don't believe I said utilization. If I did, it was a, a mistake, but um, really just the benchmarks that were set by the payer. So when the payers get their actuaries uh, engaged and come up with the uh, estimated total cost of care that hold us accountable to it, the numbers came in lower than what we anticipated. Some of that actuarial process, in some cases we negotiate every year to change what, which services are part of our accountability. And in some cases we add services, in some cases we take out, we took a few things out, um, uh, negotiated a few things out this year. Uh, to help make the accountability a little bit more uh, clean for our participants. So there's a lot of moving parts that go into those payer targets. And, you know, we try our best to understand all the ins and outs of them in the negotiation process. But ultimately, they're the ones who say, here's the, the number that you have to live by. Oh, so I, I did misunderstand you. So, so uh, reduce coverage. Is no, I wouldn't say it that way. I would say the services for which uh, one care and its participants are accountable can change every year as th as service lines are added or, or deleted. That all follows whatever the payer is doing. And in some cases, if we know there's going to be a big change, a pricing change, it's a lot easier for everybody to keep that out so we don't have to do back end reconciliations with with uh, a payer. Hmm. OK, so so I think I'm now understanding that um, that the reduced cost, let me just try and say it, tell me if I'm wrong, the reduced cost on slide 11 uh, really is driven by, or is it substantially driven by the reduced attribution? I would say it's a little bit of a mix. In Medicare, yes. Medicaid, no. Um, commercials, probably yes. Attribution came in a little bit lower than expected, or maybe a both there. So there's a number of moving parts that go into those total cost of care estimates, and ultimately where they land is 
uh, just when we compare them back, I mean, sometimes they're high, sometimes they're lower, doesn't affect actual coverage or, or, or cost even. It's an accountability measurement of here's a target that we're setting and our job is, is to be measured against that and beat it. Okay, thanks. Okay, Walter Carpenter. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, nice presentation. I want to say thanks to Mike Fisher and for what he said. And as a patient, I can tell him and everyone that I go through that every time I go to the doctor's office. Duplication of services constantly. You know, you go into a specialist and you go through the whole information thing all over again. And it's so they can bill you or bill your insurance. Um, <clears throat> I even called them on it one time. Um, so that, that's just typical. The second comment is I'd love to be on that task force you were talking about as a patient because we're the ones that pay, are paying the tabs for this. And the third sort of overall question comment, I'm not sure, is I've been listening to the budget presentation and everything and the great questions by the board members, which and Mike and Tom as well, which have been, and um, Ham, who's been fascinating, is I'm just curious, what has OneCare done for the healthcare of Vermonters? I mean, Overall, you go into the doctor's office, they rush you through. You know, it's a wham, bam, bam thing. What, I mean, that's just a small sample. You're still dealing with multi layers of private public insurance. Um, without Michael's legal aid department, I would have been screwed um, just by costs and you complain to somebody and they don't listen to you. Um, so I have to go to legal aid because the word legal in front of it, that's the only way they listen to you in the first place. So I'm just curious, kind of backing up Ham's question here is what has been done by OneCare? With all of this and Medicare and Medicaid payments, is access to healthcare any easier? I have a couple of thoughts um, that I'm happy to share. I think, um, you know, one thing I think that we do is that's important is try to support providers. It's a little bit of the Richard Branson philosophy is that if you take care of your employees, they'll take care of your customers. Part of our job is to take care of the providers and make sure that they're uh, receiving what they need to do a good job, and then that translates down to better care. I, I think that's important to note. I mean, the country at following Medicare's lead is moving to a value-based healthcare system, and we're trying to help them with that, honestly, um, to make sure that they're able to make the transition and, and succeed under the model. So I, I think by helping the providers, uh, it, it's a hope. I hope it helps the actual uh, patient care. And that comes through data, that comes through some financial resources, that comes through being in a program that counts as an advanced alternative payment model through Medicare and gets them, uh, allows them to alleviate the burden of MIPS and things like, like that. So I think that's an important one. The second one is uh, tougher to like actually show it tangibly, but I can say in the four years I've been at OneCare, there is more talk now about the concept of population health and more talk now about coordinating care more effectively. That's taking time to evolve as one would expect, but just the tone of what I hear from the providers is has evolved an awful lot over the last four years. And I, I am very hopeful that over the next four years, that starts to make care feel differently for Vermonters. And you know, it's tough to make such a big change across a whole state. If we had 5,000 lives, we could probably make a difference tomorrow. But with so many lives, it's going to take a little bit longer to make you know the kind of changes that we all want to see. Um, but that's a big one, and and I wish it was more visible. But uh, I certainly get to see it in my in my room. Yeah, I would agree with that, Tom. And the thing that I'd also like to add is I think um, it's always important to understand what problem the ACO is trying to solve. 
And the problems that the federal government has said that we need to solve is that payment incentives aren't aligned. So it goes back to those things you were talking to Walter about having to go into your doctor's office because that's the only way that they get paid, right? Is if they see you in per person and ask a series of questions. Um, it might not be sensical for either one of you to use your time that way. And the other thing is that care is not well coordinated because the payment incentives don't encourage providers to work together in a coordinated way. So those are the two problems that we're trying to solve as an ACO and that requires providing some direct supports and resources and major shifts to the provider's office to be able to meet, um, to meet those goals. Okay, we're going to go to Rick Dooley. Thanks so much. I just want to um, uh, comment on Vicki's statement about the important, uh, importance of investment in primary care. You know, we hear about risk sharing, and, and I think everyone agrees that there needs to be some risk shared. The problem with um, primary care sharing risk is we're already so underfunded as it is and barely holding on that risk puts us at risk of closure, especially independent primary care. Um, and for shared savings to work, for for us to have, you know, to share risk, we have to be able to really make an impact. I know we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I just want to shout out to Vicki to say, you know, absolutely making those investments in primary care so that we can comfortably take risk, but also take risk on the things that we can impact on. So risk on total cost of care when we're such a small percentage of care is really, really difficult. Risk based on our individual um, performance measures or ability to get folks into C-scopes or, or you know, bring hypertension, diabetes into better compliance um, absolutely makes sense and improves the whole population. So, so just a shout out, Vicki, that uh, absolutely investment in primary care, please. Okay, we'll go ahead and go back to Ham Davis. Uh, th thank you, Kevin. Uh, the, I appreciate from Tom Borey's the 180, $180 million number is really a hard piece of information. My follow-up question would be, actually, for both One Care and for the Green Mountain Care Board, that is the numerator. What is your denominator? You, the two choices, it seems to me, are the total number, the total dollars that flow through One Care, which is, I'm not sure I'm right about this, but one point something billion. Or is the bottom is the is the is the denominator supposed to be roughly the total acute care cost, which is around 2.75 billion, I think. And I think that the it's important to know which is the which is the denominator because it will drive it can drive strategic planning and action by the board. I can take a stab at it. I, mean, I think it, it kind of depends on the, what you're trying to answer or say. I mean, it, I would say it, it wouldn't make a ton of sense to use the total all payer model healthcare cost for Vermonters because a lot of that's out of state. And unless we really became more of an insurer, um, you know, paying fixed payments to out of state uh, providers just isn't, isn't realistic. So I, I think a denominator to consider would be. Of the two and a half billion, how much is in state and in a you know in a value-based healthcare participate in a value-based healthcare uh, program? That's one way to think of it. Um, another way to think of it is, I mean, our our fixed payment program is primarily hospital-based. Uh, we do have the CPR program for independent primary care, but to look at the 180 million out of the hospital spend is a pretty reasonable way to look at it too. If you're trying to figure out what percentage of hospital level care is under a capitation model that doesn't reconcile. Uh, and then the third would be to use the $1.2 billion. That's our accountability based on what we currently have contracted today. So depending on kind of where you want to go, I'd say those are three options to consider. Do you have a choice, Kevin? The board have a choice, I mean. I think we'd have to have that discussion here. I don't want to speak just as one member. Thank you. I'm done. Okay. Kevin, if, I, if I could just add to uh, a kind of the, the tail end of, of uh, Ham's comment, my guess is that the $180 million uh, doesn't factor in the cost shift. And so you can have fixed, fixed, uh, fixed payment 
but it's only for a portion of the cost. And uh, um, I would think this is just a, a kind of a quick thought that if one care were successful in in mitigating to a degree uh, it's with its in its negotiations with the state on Medicaid to begin to mitigate the cost shift. Obviously, it can't be done all at once, but but a progress forward that they would have an easier time addressing uh, Rick Dooley's concern about and and your uh, strategic report strategic plan of increasing the proportion of independent primary care practices in the true capitated program. If if the capitated program makes progress toward unwinding the kish, uh, cost shift, then I would think more independents would want to jump on board because they get paid more. They get paid more fairly. And the other the other thing I would just add to this is I do urge people to go read, um, and this is maybe in response to Walter, go read that March, I think it is the March 7th Vermont Digger article by Emma Cotton about uh, the success and one care being a part of it down at uh, Southern Vermont Hospital. Um, it's, it's quite a story and the impact is significant where um, outpatient, inpatient at one point was 80% of their caseload and now it's down to uh, under 20%. They've really, uh, according to that article, uh, transformed their delivery system and uh, one care was an important vehicle for uh, helping that happen. Thanks, Tom. I have read that, and I've read all the articles on Digger about One Care. Okay, is there other public comment? And Marissa, I, I'm assuming there's no action needed by the board at this time. That is right. There's no action. I'll I'll make a quick note about um, timeline, which I didn't mention at the beginning. Um, we don't have a, a set timeline. Um, as as people know who are involved in this process, we are also in the midst of the FY21 budget guidance development, uh, which we'll be presenting on in June. Um, and so, um, when we are through our staff analysis of this um, revised budget that will either be scheduled to come before the board or um, communication um, may come to the board through um, memo, which is how we sometimes provide updates on uh, monitoring and reporting, but no action at this time. Thank you, Marissa. And thank you, um, Vicki and Tom. And, uh, you know, we're, we keep rowing in this boat and hopefully we get to that other shore. So um, is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved by uh, Jess and seconded by Robin to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. And as a reminder to the board, we have a meeting that starts um, five minutes at the conclusion of this meeting on a certificate of need discussion. So thank you everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.